as a church, we believe deeply in that the faith once for all delivered to the saints is something that needs to be passed on to each generation. In fact, our building uh, campaign was called Generations. It's a joy to hear from the youth ministry and to watch all these young people in their journey of faith. And I have great hope for the next generation in spite of the way this world is going. And I believe that there will be those who will stand before the world as a testimony because of the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit and nothing else. Now, we need to help them with our prayers and instruction as we pass on the baton. And we know that the church is going to be different in 10 years from now than it is right now. But there are some things that should never change and will never change. And two of those practices are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, back in April of this year, we had a baptismal service, and uh, so I took the opportunity to give a, a little more elongated uh, message on baptism alone because we hadn't done that for a while. And so the same is true regarding the Lord's table. And so today, as a regular part of our worship and as a chance to encourage the next generation, we want to give a more thorough teaching of the meaning of the Lord's table. Whereas baptism is an ordinance that you, take, you partake in as an individual to say that you have faith in God, communion is a time in which we partake with one another, in which we all look each other in the eye and say we are one with God. It proclaims our ongoing fellowship as well as the cost of salvation, which costs the life of the Lamb of God. And so we've read Matthew 26 and we learn that Christianity and Judaism are virtually inseparable. Judaism leads you down a path to where, without Christianity, you say, w w where does it end? What, what was the purpose? And so Christianity comes along and tells us the key to understanding Judaism, and that key is Jesus Christ. In Matthew 18, he said, I did not come to destroy the law of Moses, but to fulfill it. And those of you who have studied the Old Testament know that many of the prophecies focus upon the life of the Messiah, and especially the last week of his life. And I believe that God sovereignly lined up the events of Christ's life to be in line with many of the Jewish festivals. And the one festival that is before us now is the Passover. And that is something that we all ought to be familiar with. And if you're not, let me give you a thumbnail sketch of it. Hundreds of years before this time when Christ is walking the earth, God delivered Moses and the people of Israel out of the hands of Pharaoh. Moses went before Pharaoh and sought permission to be released because the Jews were all slaves of Egypt, but the Pharaoh would not let, them, let the people go. And so God sent nine plagues upon the nation of Egypt to release the grip, but Pharaoh still would not let God's people go. And so God announced a final tenth plague in which he warned that every firstborn child of animal in beast, uh, animal and human would be taken by, a, by an angel unless the family did the following. They were to take a, a lamb, an innocent spotless lamb, and sacrifice it and then collect its blood and paint it on the, the post and lintels of their home. And if the blood was found on their home when the death angel came, he would pass over their house, or in the Hebrew, Pesach, to skip. They would skip their house. And so the lamb was to be set aside for four days to be examined to make sure it was spotless. And every test imaginable was performed. And we know from the New Testament that the same thing happened to Jesus Christ during that last week of his life. For four days, he was tested by the government, tested by the religion, tried by his personal holiness before his disciples, and he was a perfect lamb of God. Now, we don't have time to delve into everything in verses 14 through 19, but we see that behind the scenes of this Passover, Judas is 
getting ready to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And at the same time, other disciples have gone out to find a room to celebrate this Passover in the upper room. But the one thing we need to understand about this Passover was that it was birthed in the shadow of betrayal. Verses 21 through 22 say, When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve, and as they were eating, he said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were all very sorrowful and began to say, Is it I? Is, is it I, Lord? What a shocking statement that must have been to these devoted believers. In fact, Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper has tried to capture the facial expressions of the disciples. And when you look at Judas, he recoils and grabs his money bag all the harder, and he spills a salt shaker onto the table. Chuck Swindoll wisely observed that one of the men chosen to be the salt of the earth is about to rub salt in the wounds of the Savior. All the disciples reacted, and to their credit, they became self-conscious. They were filled with distress. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? And I want you to know none of them said, is it Judas? A clear point that must be made at this first communion is that Jesus wanted there to be self-inspection. Self-examination is a key attitude when participating in the Lord's table. Without it, you're not participating properly. It's a time when we ask ourselves, am I really right with Jesus? Is there something blocking my fellowship with him that needs attention? Now, in the Gospel of John, we find a little more detail about this situation in John 13. We learn that John was on the right side of Jesus, and he leaned into Jesus, and he asked him, who's going to betray you? So you need to understand in Matthew, Jesus isn't announcing that it's Judas. He whispers it to John, and he says, the one who dips his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Now, it's likely that Judas was sitting on his left side, not Peter, Judas, because he was the treasurer. And he leans into Jesus, and he says, like everybody else, is it I, Lord? Is it I? And it's at that point that Jesus says to him, what you do, do quickly. And the rest of the disciples didn't know what he was talking about. Now, one of the reasons that I am not thrilled about churches that stress outward appearances regarding how you dress and behavioral codes is because of how easy it is to pretend. Judas was a master faker. He said all the right things, wore all the right clothes, acted respectfully in every situation. He did everything right, but nobody said, is it Judas? Can you see how gracious the Lord was even at this point of betrayal and to this sick man? He gave him every opportunity to repent. He didn't announce that Judas was the betrayer. He didn't scream, this is the one, he's the one. He gave him a chance to confess his sin, but he would not. The Lord's Supper, which we so faithfully observe as a thing of beauty, started with betrayal and pain. Matthew 26, 26 says, Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread after the blessing, and he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and he said, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for you now to understand the prophetic significance of this night we need to comprehend a little bit the jewish seder the word seder means order it's the way that for generations before christ the jews celebrated passover in the absence of the temple it consisted of several parts the first part was the kedush which was a prayer. The father would light some candles and drink the first cup of wine. And he would say, Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'alom barei peri hagafen. Next was the karpalos. The celebrators would 
take parsley and dip it in a bowl of salt water and eat it. And it was at this point when Judas was dipping in with Jesus that Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. Get out of here. Scram. Next was the breaking of the bread. And there were three pieces of unleavened bread in this supper. And they were wrapped in a white cloth and Many of us believe they represent the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at this point, Jesus, the, the Father would take the middle one out, and it was called the afikamen. And he would break it, but then he would hide part of it somewhere to later be found by the children. Afikamen means dessert, or that which comes after, or surprise. This is one of the reasons why our children seek for Easter eggs in, on Easter. And then after that, the father would spend two hours on the message for the evening. And if we go over time, it's the youth's fault. We got a late start today. But he would go over four questions. Why is this night different? And on this night, we eat bitter herbs. Why? On this night, we dip food in salt water. Why? On this night, we lean on pillows instead of sitting straight in the chairs. And for two hours, the father would explain the exodus. He explained about walking through the Red Sea and, and that the salt water represented their tears because they were in captivity. And they would eat sparse things because they were on the run. He emphasized the unleavened bread as well, and how God did not want them to take anything from their previous life that would contaminate them. The bowl of paste, or the karaseth, was made of apples and nuts, and it looked like a little brick, and it reminded them of their slavery. The egg represented divine involvement and perhaps the beginning of new life. The leg of lamb was the picture of the sacrifice, and of course the wine pictured the most precious blood that would cause the angel to pass over in essence, the father went through the whole history of the exodus of Israel. But unfortunately, they did not see the significance of everything. And they even sang portions of the psalm. Psalms 119 through, uh, 113 through 118 was their hymn book for this celebration. And then following some singing, they would drink the third cup, which was the cup of Elijah because they had a hopes that Elijah would come just before the Messiah would return, or would come. But then after that third cup, this is when Jesus transformed the whole Passover supper. He took the ephekamen, and he held it up, and he said, this is me. This is me. You see, the, the Jews didn't really understand the, the imagery of the ephekamen. It just was kind of a, oh, we're just trying to entertain the kids so they don't get up and run around. He said, this is my body. He transformed the end of the service and applied it to himself. And then he took the cup and he, and he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my blood. And by the way, those of you who don't understand that this is symbolic. Jesus wasn't dead yet when he said, this is my body and this is my cup. He was saying this is symbolic of what I'm about ready to do. It's the blood of the new covenant which was made with Israel and by God's grace, we're under that covenant too. According to Paul, we are ministers of the new covenant that is based upon the sacrifice and blood of Christ. And so he's referring to his own death that is to come. So Jesus took the last two acts of the Passover meal and he forever transformed them into our communion service. And they, they even ended the Seder with Psalm 118 and we we're pretty sure that Psalm 118.24 was the verse they sang when they dismissed themselves. And you know what that verse is? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Do you understand what that day was talking about? It was talking about that night, that Passover, the most precious day in earthly history when the Lamb of God was about ready to die for our sins. 
You say, what is there to rejoice about that? You can rejoice because every single one of us can be made right with God the Father because of that sacrifice. And without it, you would have no life. It doesn't matter how old you are as you sit here. There is only one way that forgiveness of sins can be attained. And you as a young generation need to understand this because if you don't preach this, you will not have a church. You know, you can call it a church. But it is the blood of Christ upon the cross that allows us to be forgiven. And so I ask you, have you received that forgiveness? Have you painted the blood over the post and lintels of your heart? You can do it right now if you call out to him. Tell God you realize your sin and how only Christ could take it away. Trust him, pray to him that you believe his sacrifice on the cross was for you. How sad it is when we partake of this meal and we just go through the motions like some of the Jews did. They, they didn't understand what it was pointing to, but it was something you had to do. So what can we do to make sure this meal stays fresh and is not just a mere ritual? Well, that's where our next passage comes into play, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And won't read the whole thing right now, 23 through 31. But it starts out saying, I received, Paul is saying, I received what the Lord delivered to me. This is my body. This is my blood. And so the first thing we need to understand when we participate, verse 25, is that we do this in remembrance, in honor of Christ's death and sacrifice. That should be the primary thing. We are picturing the death of the Lord of the ages. There's no command, by the way, as to how often you do this, though we choose to do it once a month and then some if we can. But no matter how often it is, it's up to you personally to make sure you are prepared, that you have examined yourself. I can't reach into your mind and tell you how to think. You need to guide your thinking when you come together. And so Paul specifically drew attention to the bread, and he broke it, and he repeated the words of Christ, this is my body. We must remember that the Son of God took on flesh so that he could take your place on the cross. That's the main thing we are portraying. And you'll notice in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 19 that it talks about how if there's anything between you, a brother or sister, that's why communion is something that you do with other people. Baptism is something you do by yourself. Communion is something that you do with one another. And honestly, I don't think you can really participate in communion by yourself. You can try. But the object is that you're with other people who are saying the same thing. We have all come to God on the same basis. It's the blood of Christ, not my works, not my goodness, not my obedience, but the blood of Christ, and that puts us all on the same plane. And there will always be troubles amongst people in any kind of group there is. That's what verse 19 is saying. The differences for Christians is how you deal with those differences. And part of how you deal with it, this hour, this time is made for us to examine our own hearts. I say again, self-examination is a key attitude when participating in the Lord's table. Self-examination. None of this, well, what about them over there? They're partaking of this wrongly because I know they did something wrong this week. It's none of your business. It's self-examination. You need to deal with any damaged relationships and demonstrate the self-sacrifice of Christ who gave himself up to die for, on our behalf. Now, we know that all problems cannot be solved. Romans chapter 12 tells us, though, if it's all possible, if it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. And so the Lord's table is when you amplify self-examination. It's where you say, maybe I'm the problem, not looking at anybody else. And maybe you need to forego participation in this meal right now. Maybe, maybe you, you need to meet with someone who you, are, you know that you are in conflict with. Maybe you had an argument with your spouse on the way to church or last night. 
Or maybe you over-scolded your child for something and their feelings were crushed. Well, don't underestimate the effect on your children when you admit that you're wrong. That's what the Lord's table is about. It will deepen their faith. It will not take it away. So in the Lord's Supper, Jesus left us a portrait or a movie, a moving picture of his sacrifice. We participated in a moving way. We eat bread, we eat the cup. And I would recommend, when you know that we're going to celebrate the Lord's table, that you spend some time the night before in self-examination. Before you come to church, ask yourself, am I the problem? Is it I? In case you didn't have time to examine yourself before this moment, I want you to take some time to do it now. I'd like you to turn to hymn number 274, if you would, and have it ready, as well as we're going to pass the elements in a moment, have the bread ready. But as it's being passed, I want... You take some time, and if you don't know Jesus Christ and you want to know him, just cry out to him all that I've been saying. I know you died for me. I receive that as my, receive you as my personal Savior. But if you're already a Christian, maybe you need to do some inventory in your life. And so as the elements are passed here in a second, go into a time of prayer, and then I'll start singing. You don't have to join me until you're done praying. But just keep that in mind, because Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. So 
divine demands my soul my life my own lord we are so grateful for your selfless love that sent your most precious son to take our place upon the cross. We know we sometimes take you for granted. And we do not want to do this. We long for when every thought will be of you. For now, Lord, we express our deep love and thankfulness as we eat this bread with us all. Let me say this by way of comfort to you if you feel like you have to forego the elements because of some sin. John Duncan was a prominent Scottish theologian and once at a communion service held in Scotland, when the elements came to a 16-year-old girl, she suddenly turned her head aside and motioned for the elder to, to take the cup away because she, she couldn't drink it. And Professor Duncan reached his arm over and he touched her shoulder and he said tenderly, Take it, lassie. It's for sinners. Don't let too much time go by before you partake. If you have something immediately to deal with, deal with it. But don't just put it off and say, oh, I can't take it until I deal with this, but I'm not going to deal with it. You've got to deal with it. This meal is for sinners. 1 Corinthians 11, 26 adds, For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink. Our Lord, we realize that this cup represents your son's supreme sacrifice. He gave his life. He gave his dreams for us. And deep in our hearts, we desire that the whole world would understand your sacrificial love. We drink this cup as a way to proclaim before anyone here who does not know you yet that you died for their sins. And we can partake of this meal in a joyful way because we know that you did not stay dead. You conquered death, and you are coming again to receive us unto yourself. And so we drink with this full understanding until you return to Jerusalem someday. In Christ's name, amen.